Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach and this is another talk on logic, philosophy, and my favorite philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein. This is uh, my hopefully me middle length talk on the philosophical investigations, the major first and foremost work uh, Wittgenstein put together by his students after his death out of his notebooks. And then the rest of his notebooks are put into this and that work titled by his name. The only work he published during his life, I do believe, is the Tractatus, which he did with the help of Russell in his earlier period. I just gave a three talks now, um, a talk on uh, the turtles all the way around, which I do believe is a central idea of Wittgenstein, uh, a talk on Wittgenstein's early and later life, and a talk on Wittgenstein's oven of his middle period. So this is a talk explaining the basic ideas of the philosophical investigations, which uh, you can listen to the, well, any of those talks, including my talks on philosophy and logic before this, but Wittgenstein's oven is particularly helpful because he is moving from truth table logic into something like an anti-oven perspective, as mentioned, with the Hansel and the Gretel, not so much. So let's turn here to my lecture on the investigations. So Wittgenstein wrote in the preface to his investigations, which he did pen before he died and was subsequently published posthumously, that he never found a satisfying order for his later thoughts because they were interconnected in complex ways, like many sketches of landscapes from different perspectives composed over long wandering journeys. That is such a beautiful opening because that truly does capture what he was trying to grasp with his later thought. We have perspectives involving our eyes, ears, and words, and we have these different, many complex interweavings of what we think and he had several different ways he wove his thought together from different perspectives, which does fit overall very much the underlying rule of no real rules. It is a bit like the moral of no morals of Alice and Wonderland, but I will, uh, there is a bit of an ethic, certainly a central ethic to Wonderland, although it is shy a bit about morals and rules, which fits with Wittgenstein very well. So this following talk is my attempt to weave Wittgenstein's thoughts in the philosophical investigations together to put the ideas in a more teachable sequence. And this will be a bit different from reading the investigations, but hopefully before you read the investigations, you can listen to this talk to help you make sense of Wittgenstein's notes, which he does not explain directly other than saying what I just did, that these are complex perspectives that he uh, over uh, like journeys over landscapes. The ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus, my favorite ancient Greek philosopher, as well as Nietzsche's, uh, said that all is in flux and thus we cannot step in the same river twice. And Wittgenstein actually quoted these two different thoughts, I believe without mentioning Heraclitus either time, in different notes. And he probably did know uh, that it was Heraclitus um, and knew that Nietzsche liked Heraclitus. And Wittgenstein wrote that if we want to understand life, we must learn to feel at home in primeval chaos. If there is no absolute stabilities or immortal things on earth here, then we have to learn to deal with things that are somewhat mortal, somewhat spatial, somewhat reasoned, but not entirely. Somewhat talked out, but not entirely. Our world and ways of life in it continuously change, ever so slightly, but continuously. And so our lives are full of doubts and uncertainties. The bustle of life is not exactly regular, repeating itself often, very often, otherwise meaning and truth could not be possible in language use, but not entirely, or any behavior for that matter, including language use. And neither, exactly regular, are the ways we speak and think about it. It does seem like each of our thoughts is a novel, individual, organic living thing, or at least a thing we are doing for the first time each time, even if it is highly regular. I have lectures and routines I talk amongst myself with all the time, again and again, but each time it is rehashing it and recycling it, yes, and reconnecting it. Very much as psychologists say about how we re-remember each of our memories, we don't simply play a recording. That has influenced my thinking on this a lot. That thought fits very well with Wittgenstein. If you understand that you're not just playing a recording of your memories, but you're re-weaving them every time, that is very much like thinking and imagination and thought in everything in Wittgenstein. We are re-weaving simple elements as we are trained behavioristically to do. Very much salivating Pavlov. So let's go onward here. 
Uh, uncertainty is at the roots of life and every deep philosophical question. A lot of these are me rehashing Wittgenstein's quotes and compacting them, and that is very much almost a direct quote. Wittgenstein said that this difficult point, that uncertainty and variability is at the roots of everything deep in life and philosophical, is perhaps the best place to begin, he says, our philosophical investigations, which is why I begin with his quotes uh, of Heraclitus without naming him. Even though this is not the way the philosophical investigations begins, in fact, the way his students arrange the philosophical investigations, whether he would have liked it or not, he probably, as many say, would have put more emphasis on the second part, which was left un, uh, incom un, incomplete, but was more about the duck rabbit and, and child psychology, which I focus on myself for just that reason. Those were the sorts of thinkings, and Wittgenstein was, uh, was a teacher of children for a time that child development is really where to learn more about Wittgenstein a lot and about adult thinking continuously. So the beginning of the philosophical investigations, though, as the students, his uh, students arrange them, begins focusing on children learning language. If I had to refocus the investigations, and this is somewhat of what I'm doing here with this talk, I would put it first and foremost on the wordless child turning into the worded child. Yes, the child who can use language from the womb through till language use should get more of an emphasis. But instead of that, Wittgenstein opens very much with the Augustine, or at least it is arranged such that it opens with the quote of Augustine. Wittgenstein did arrange things somewhat similarly. It's not completely accidental that's in the beginning, according uh, for Wittgenstein's efforts himself intentionally. But it starts with saying, well, what if we walk into a shop and we use language? And then it considers basic language use, but it's already starting at language use and it's n and basic language use and looking at rudimentary language use, not looking at rudimentary sensation or emotion. That is all kind of passed over and then it's now we're using language. Let's look at the basics of language use. And I think that helps people understand Wittgenstein. I think it's a slight misunderstanding is centering everything on language use when in fact he talks a lot about language use. How could he talk otherwise? But he's actually showing how it's a network of several simple things, complex things, all the things, clean all the things, but uh, clearing ground, as Wittgenstein says. Yes, Allison, I forget, not Gobnik, but I forget the cartoonist, uh, the, hero, the comedian's name. Hello, buddy. I don't forget my cat, though. He reminds me. There's always something there to remind me of my cat. So Wittgenstein says, though, speaking of cats and uncertainty, you know, and opening a box, of uh, problems here. Wittgenstein says that that uncertainty is in everything is perhaps the most difficult place, but that's the place we should begin. Now, the reason why that's important in the wake of Frege and Russell is Frege and Russell are trying to, uh, a la boule, boil the world down to immutable universal rules. Now, Wittgenstein tried that with truth tables, but at this point, he is going to say, please don't attack the curtain, buddy. He is going to say, that language use does not have fixed universal rules. It is actually, in a certain sense, conditioned very general situations of behavior is the best way of saying it in the clearest language to the person first coming to it. And that does put it in a psychological behavioristic mode of, lang of, of terms. And then I actually do find decently appropriate. As long as we understand, Wittgenstein did not think we're a, a, a black box with no experience in ways that behaviorism is often put uh, unpleasantly, I have to say, by some. Not by B.F. Skinner, I think, but by some. I still actually have to turn to B.F. Skinner because I do believe B.F. Skinner was quite influenced by Wittgenstein and did not think, as people say, he was not trying to be the cold, uh, sort of dead-to-emotion behaviorist that some uh, seem to have given it a, uh, well, a sheen to. But... So would we want to, if everything is uncertain around us, let's stop and think. So many people privilege the positive terms, people have pointed out, that they don't privilege uncertainty, but then they call it freedom and they like it. So would we want to exchange our unpredictable lives of uncertainty for predictable lives of absolute certainty? Would we want to know the future? Would we want to know exactly what's going to happen to us or what will we will do next week exactly and plan it out? Whether or not you're a type A or like, you know, obsessive person or whatever have you, and I am somewhat and somewhat not plenty, there's something deeply disturbing, almost robotic about it that feels confining. Um, and perhaps we are, as Hegel said, drawn in both ways emotionally and in contradiction with ourselves, which is the feeling of being alive and of being a thinking human being with emotions and practices of words going off in every direction. 
Would we want to know what others feel and think with complete certainty? Eliminating the possibility of lies, games, and mysteries. If I know what you're thinking or what the author's going to say, there's no more surprise. Than mystery. How can this kind of thing happen in America? There's no mystery. There's no murder mysteries. There's no games in which I don't know what the next chess move is. Imagine if we all watched brilliant computers play a calculated game of chess in which we already knew who the winner was going to be because they told us, now let's watch the moves. There would be no uncertainty to chess. There'd be no chance. Yes? If Deep Blue is playing a human being, as far as I understand back in the day, people weren't sure who would win. Regardless, but it is not clear that we would trade our lives in for certainty, as living in a certainty would be quite unfamiliar. Feel funny. A lot in Wittgenstein is based on so much as us feeling things are familiar or not. Watch people's faces, look at how much feeling things are familiar or unfamiliar, such that they can feel they can go on or not and act how much that is in the roots of everything we do and think, and how much we ignore that or just glance at it in ourselves and others to get by. And yet without familiarity, unfamiliarity, the feeling of curiosity, curiouser and curiouser for Alice following the rabbit with passion down the uh, rabbit hole. We're going down the rabbit hole, something fierce here, and we're going to find quite a bunch of complexes, endlessly. Not just one basement level. That we would... It is quite clear we would not, though, whether or not some people would say, yes, I would like a completely predictable life and then look into it as much as I would like. It is clear we would not trade our lives in for complete chaos. Thankfully, there are things that remain somewhat the same that we grow to trust as familiar. Familiar people, such as parents, family, friends, and teachers and authorities. Familiar objects, such as food, toys, tools, and furniture. And familiar places, such as homes, school, parks, stores, streets, roads, and trails. Now, I'm going to call these familiars, which is a word I have been using. For, uh, this is Berkeley. There's more than one, I believe, uh, Wiccan coven uh, here. I have not seen them out and about lately. Um, but with all of that, the familiars are, of course, I have cats. A uh, familiar is like uh, an animal or a being that you keep around with you. Yes, there's one that then you are familiar with that helps you work this or that or do whatever. A familiar here is something like you often have apples in your life. You often have a mother, a father, or guardians. You often, guardian, you often have, you know, something like, uh, I guess you have, uh, well, school, work, stores. Think about how, of course, if you walked into a strange dimension each time you did anything, we could not have brains the way we have them. Yes, bodies, brains, nerves, how everything works. Uh, again, as Foucault says, examine power on the capillary level. So we absorb the ways of each of these things as we familiarize with them growing up. Think about how it would be impossible, not only as a child before language use, but as a child with language use, to describe everything and process everything in words. And how you have to be sensory, emotionally, and verbally processing as a person constantly with your focus of attention only being able to pay attention to one thing and only so much of that thing as it moves around. I do like to say there are images psychologists and uh, brain uh, neurologists and others have shown in which looking around a painting, people don't look at exactly the same number of objects in the same order, but they often look at this or that and then their eyes move around and there's uh, pathways of their eye movements they can read in the brain now showing what you look at very much a map of what a Wittgensteinian organic individual thought would look like would be something somewhat like those pictures, I believe, of eyes moving around a painting. Except in this case, it would be our eyes moving around the sensations, the emotions, the, sen the facial expressions, and thus feeling the emotions of others, or recalling or imagining them. I could imagine we could recall, we could sense and experience the emotions of others as the emotions or even in other ways, as alternate emotions of our own and in different complexes. But leaving all that where it is, we are weaving like a spider many elements together and like the spider or our focus of attention only at one element at any time moving rapidly through the whole. And of course, that must play a very central role in how we weave our thinking together such that it consciously and unconsciously affects us and our behavior. I certainly think that we could be unconsciously conditioned all the time. I think that is constantly happening. However, it wouldn't be in a secret cellar in secret language. It would be just the whole organism, body, and mind soaking up everything around us. And then what we are conscious of as thinking is the focus of our attention intentionally turning and interweaving and associating and disassociating, adding and subtracting this or that element emotionally in the ways we have already seen others do differently and similarly. 
That would be the best way of explaining what thought and all of behavior, talking to oneself and others, and acting in any way towards Apple or others, is for Wittgenstein. I believe that is the best explanation I can give you in simple words anyway, I humbly say, and that is because the simpler the better for Poe. And I have been re inspired to return to Carol and Wittgenstein's work in the wake of Poe's detective stories, and I intend on clarifying just a bit for myself and others. So we absorb all of these ways. We learn from others to feel funny about or comfortable about what things are included and excluded such that it would feel funny to keep the eggs in a cake rather than discard them in the trash and forget them. We gather and divide things like the queens try to lead Alice through and are uh, sad that she can't figure out when you divide a loaf with a knife, then you get slices, not four, slices. Again, which is simple process, almost mathematical, of thinking and interweaving several things like a loaf and a knife together and then you have something in the end, which is interwoven with it, slices of bread. So we watch many things getting done as children and we are crawling around putting things in our mouths and we watch mistakes being made all around us, people feeling uncomfortable, people directing and uh, misdirecting us towards or away from this or that and we are judging and feeling about others and things as we do, and we watch things get broken into smaller, simpler parts or included in larger, complex groups, depending on how they are used. When we ask for a broom, as I've mentioned, as Wittgenstein says, we are not asking for the broom's handle or a broom-shaped collection of atoms. We are asking for the broom, and in a way we are indirectly asking for the broom handle or the atoms in the broom. And that is a good way of seeing it. If we're asking for an at atoms in the broom, we are doing physics experiments with different circuits of activity. Atoms do not appear unless we are in circuits of activity looking for atoms and dealing with atoms. Otherwise, we are not dealing with atoms. In the same way I would say, you're using your brain all day long, you are mostly not dealing with neurons intentionally. I, If you understand me when I say that, that you're not dealing with neurons intentionally, nor in fact am I dealing with math right now at all, quantitatively, that regardless of how many brain cells I have that are firing, that would be very much what we're talking about. The basic, simple, elemental parts of a chair are pieces of wood or the atoms in them, depending on how we are using what parts. We're talking about intentionality and reality here as we experience it. Just as a chair can be used as a chair, as a doorstop, or as a philosophical example of a general familiar object, freely, whenever I please. Just as we are, and think about how I can use a chair and not to sit in, but as a philosophical example, and you don't experience any hiccup. A lot of this is actually noticing where you don't hiccup or where you don't stutter. And if we notice how freely that interchanges, you can truly see what we don't notice. I always love to mention that joke from The Simpsons where Lisa's li listening to the jazz violinist and the guy at the neighboring table says, this is awful. And Lisa says, you have to no listen for the notes he's not, she's not playing. And the guy's like, I can do that at home. There is something for what we're not doing in all of this. If I use a chair as an example and then we just keep going, I did not use a chair to sit in just now. And we didn't hiccup or have any problem with that. That is because you are not simply trained to sit in chairs. You're trained to use them as examples. You're trained to use them as furniture. You're, and all of this overlaps in ways we cannot verbally simply distinguish. Try to figure out what the difference is between sitting in a chair and it being a piece of furniture. And just like I said right there, it will get weird and hazy. Some people may try to equate the two. You can leave it nice and hazy and open because that's actually how it is experienced until we particularize it for particular use. I drag a chair into the room and sit in it. Now it is a seating chair. It wasn't a moment ago. And if you say, well, my brain isn't that talented to flow that way, yes, it is. It's what you're not doing that is most important here, which is why it's very hard to see. It's the same with what you're not doing is putting everything in language or in emotions as the bedrock level. That is difficult for people who try to base all of thought in emotional complexes or all of thought in logical, verbal, or mathematical verbal, math, uh, verbal intelligence as mathematics complexes. It's hard to see that intelligence cannot simply be sensory or emotive or logical. And by logical, I largely mean verbal. When I mean logical, when I say logical, I mean both, it's smart somewhat, but I usually mean logical as in verbal. It's been verbalized. I do not use it freely the way that many people use the words logical and rational. I say smart, I say dumb a lot, a lot, more than I want to. But that's because of me, of course, not you. Now are nobody who looks like it. You know, two arms, two legs, a face. So with all of that, we 
are familiar with chairs, but not just as things to sit in. Don't try to work it out more than that. Allow it to be open that way. And here you can experience the vertigo of, well, what's a chair really? Well, you're conditioned to deal with chairs plenty, so it doesn't have to be something more so really we need to resolve. And that's tricky for people to grasp and not try to reduce. Ad absurdum. Just as we are not taught to play chess in our minds without a board in pieces, but we could... Notice sensor, the sensations of the chess pieces play into all the rules of the verbalizations or the spatial reasoning and the imagination of the moves. We could be taught to. We don't have to be, Wittgenstein says, leaving the window open again. Meaning is not privately inside our minds. This is, fits with Wonderland also, specifically Humpty Dumpty and a couple other things. Meaning is not privately inside our minds. Rather, it is in shared public practices in familiar circumstances where we have learned how to do things like others or slightly unlike others. Meaning isn't a mental activity, Wittgenstein says, any more than a rise in butter prices is an independent act of butter. Let me say that again. Meaning isn't a mental activity, is not an interior thing, any more than a rise in butter prices is an independent act of butter. Why? Well, if meaning is what you're seeing outside of you, imagining inside of you, feeling about all of this, and talking out with yourself and others, then meaning is uh, activity inside and outside of you altogether as circuit. In the same way, you could point across the wall, say, is that red over there on that wall in your mind? And somebody could say, well, I guess it's in my brain. And as the Zen master said, then you must have a difficult uh, time picking your head up off the floor if it's inside your mind. Meaning is inside, outside of you as far as we experience this world inside and outside of us as our brains, minds, bodies, and lives. So meaning is not an inner mental activity. It is a social activity. And here again, we come to Foucault, the postmodernist, post-structuralist, and others. When a tree falls in the forest for the Zen, it does not necessarily make a sound, but if nobody's around to connect to it through the ears and the mind. So the, for the tree falling and the sound and everything is not simply inside or outside of you. Anybody who tries to put it inside or outside of you ends up put, uh, trying to eliminate the unnecessary elements, and then you end up eliminating the tree outside of you in order for a tree to fall in the forest and mean anything to you. Well, you don't have to eliminate the tree outside of you or your senses. It doesn't put any of this on purely objective footing, as in now we know the absolute truth. But in the interweaving of things competently or incompetently, that is what truth and meaning is, in inner and outer altogether practice. Most of the time, in familiar everyday cases, we easily understand and use words. But the stranger the case, the less clear it is what to say or how what is said should be used. If all cases were abnormal, that would be if everything was changing and we had no certain, no regularity. The ways we use words would not work. We'd have different brains. We'd be different creatures if the world was just sliding all around on us. Maybe it is, of course, and we do not see those parts of it. Just as if lumps of cheese, Wittgenstein said, unpredictably change size and weight, pricing cheese would be useless. We imagine, you know, cheese could be cheese, but people sort of give it away because sometimes cheese just explodes into a giant, you know, uh, a giant asteroid of cheese. It just changes sizes randomly, so people give cheese away because they can't price it for $2.99. Now, if you said, oh, cheese stays exactly the same, no. In our chaotic world, cheese slowly, you know, evap the moisture leaves. You can't keep cheese forever out anywhere. So actually, cheese does change size and weight. It just does so close, uh, so slowly that if you refrigerate it, I guess we're not French, you essentially could eat it for a week, you know what I mean, or whatever have you, and it would stay effectively, relatively the same, which would be the certainty and the staying the same, in quotey fingers. Yes, Dan, 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 dancing, can, can, quotey fingers. So as the Red Queen tells Alice, there is a game of chess being played all over the world, a both predictable and unpredictable arrangement. And this actually does. I think Lewis Carroll did understand that games and everything were interwoven out of several different elements, and he resisted reducing all of logic to one mathematical practice, as well as all a mathematical practice to one example or meaning of it. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and both are variable in the eyes of Lewis Carroll, which is very, very proto Wittgenstein, and is currently the brilliant thinking people are trying to figure out more, according to me and many others I learned from. So we come to feel familiar with many ways of doing things, just as we feel with old friends. But ways that are different feel unfamiliar, strange and odd. This is essential, all of this feeling continuously, whether or not we're paying attention to it. Thinking would not function, I am definitely arguing, without 
the feelings, Wittgenstein continues to mention the feeling things fit, the feeling I can go on, which of course means things are odd or curious where things feel they can't, they don't fit entirely. And then we feel depressed and feel we can't go on. I definitely think mania, depression, all of these things are various overlapping basic emotional states children are reading in adults with the emotions in them such that we never have to fully verbalize any of this. In a similar way, as I often point out to students, if you walk into a classroom, you perceive the chairs, but you haven't counted them. That means there may be some number of chairs, but effectively for everyone there, there is not a number of chairs in the room yet, which is weird, but it is like the tree falling in the forest or Schrodinger's cat, somewhat. Schrodinger, yes. In a certain sense, we're not fully rationalizing or fully enumerating the situation, and we only do for specific purposes. If I asked anybody how many chairs are there in the room, who doesn't know why, people might find it odd that I would ask, because for what purpose? We only need enough chairs for the students. Otherwise, And if we need one more, we'll get one more, We do or two more, but that's as much as we quantize. We're not going to say because there's 38 here, who cares? That's not important, so we don't quantize that. It has nothing to do with how determinate anything is in the room, does it? Because we can say, well, there isn't a quasi amount of chairs, as far as any of us know, and yet the number is unquantized for any purposes, which means it is not, I would argue, secretly in the brain. It would be weird if we look at a tree, knew it had 64 leaves, but didn't tell ourselves that consciously. I have a feeling our brain does not quantize things and has to quantize things with number words consciously in order to quantize them at all. That would make sense if the human brain only had math and literacy recently, yes? And I do believe it need only have had math and literacy for specialized tasks recently. I don't think we need three and a half elk for anything or four and a half arrows for anything exactly. So with all of that, uh, what we do is we feel out situations. And if it feels like we should figure out how many chairs are there, we do or we don't. And it does not effectively exist in our reality, which is odd but is actually very much the effect of what's going on here. And I do believe, sincerely, this gives us thinking more as we actually experience it. I would be I would be interested if any of my students had over these years reacted differently to these words. Some get confused, but they never usually come up with good arguments how these chairs were already a quantity. Um, but again, it is a bit of the tree falling in the forest, and it is easy to say, no, it just made a sound we did not hear, as if there is a number of chairs we did not quantize, as if there's numbers of things all around cats, and they just never are aware of that at all. Which is one way of putting it. It's simply, Wittgenstein would say, that's not very fruitful. That's not a very useful way of putting things, that a lot exists, but not to us or not in our practices. Yes, that is a little bit impractical, just a bit. So we learn to trust ourselves and others, and even objects and places, but not completely. I think trust and distrust is very central to all of this. We misunderstand and are misunderstood, creating problems that require interaction and negotiation. Much of the time, we trust the familiar without thinking. Sitting in a chair that happens to collapse, and other times we trust with too much, trust with too much thinking, reasoning away what we hope isn't true. No examples of that in politics. Regardless, trusting as we do in situations that are always somewhat unknown and unfamiliar, but always somewhat familiar, is the background and backdrop of all the ways we speak and think about what is and isn't. Without all of this, it would be very difficult to do anything at all. Even when we are in an amusement park or on serious drugs, a lot is very familiar enough such that we're not completely catatonic or completely in a screaming hissy fit. Wittgenstein remarked that if he looked out his window and saw a strange, unfamiliar world, that he would suppose he'd gone mad. And I have remarked several times, it's amazing, I already have mentioned, it's amazing we would turn to a friend and say, hey, are you seeing whales outside your window too? Why would you trust what your friend says if you can't trust your eyes? Because we are actually many different inner networks of hearing people tell us things, seeing things with our eyes. If our eyes or our visual imagination went out, we may still trust what the doctors and our friends tell us which shows you how things are actually several interwoven things, like the sheep with 14 knitting needles in the middle of the looking glass, I believe is the categories and the uh, forms of proposition. But trust is so central to truth and meaning, thus, to grounding the ways of our lives, that if we found ourselves in an unfamiliar world, we would doubt our own senses and reasoning and sanity and minds, the most trustworthy and reliable sources of experience and evidence we have. As Mar uh, Groucho Marx says, who are you going to trust, me or your own eyes? Well, you have to trust your own eyes until you can't, and then you trust Groucho Marx or not. That's weird. But it makes sense if nothing is a completely trustable source for such a visual, ocular creature. And it's quite a familiar creature that trusts so many people and cannot learn a single word without trust of others who tell us these words. How many words do you make up? 
out of Euro, out of whole cloth. So this is why Zhuang Zhe, the Taoist, can wonder if he is a butterfly dreaming he is a man, or a man dream who was dreaming he was a butterfly last night. And Descartes, the rationalist, can imagine the world is the work of a deceiving demon. Otherwise, we could not imagine this world is a lie, any kind of way. And Zhuang Zhe is a very different thinker from Descartes, one uh, very much the skeptic to very much the dogmatist. Much of Wittgenstein's thought is focused on the many ways we use language, which is why the investigation opens with a quote from Augustine rather than Heraclitus, which is why I reframe it here. Wittgenstein says we can imagine a language that works like a chest of drawers. This is the Augustinian store in the beginning of the philosophical investigations. With each word and concept used with a particular type of thing, much as a drawer holds either socks or pants. Naming a thing or group of things is like attaching a name tag or label to them, and using a name to call for a thing is like using a name tag to identify and open a drawer. While we can use such a simple drawer-like language to do things, what Wittgenstein says is this is not completely wrong, but he gives a lot of examples. He gives the ordering a slab and pillars and beams, and he gives the going to a store and the store owner opens a, there's five apples in this drawer like a hyper-computerized program, but he then says, but these are just simple ways of using language we feel are most basic to language, but don't we use language in different ways other than this? Now, what is he doing in the opening of the investigations as he does that? He is suggesting the most common ways we would boil things down to universal forms in language are often in general, but not universal. That buying things in a store in which everything has its own drawer is how we could do things, but we don't entirely. It would be weird and robotic. What that is suggesting, which is hard to read between the lines the first time you pick up the investigations and just start reading the opening pages, I must say. And it took me a while and several instructors and professors to understand this a bit better for myself. But I did all that as an undergrad and I have just been puzzling over all this since. So Wittgenstein says that Augustine describes hearing language as a child the way that adults already familiar with language hear an unfamiliar foreign one and that, oh, I know each word has a singular meaning, but each word does not have a single meaning in a single drawer, you see. It doesn't work that way. We teach young children language by directing their attentions to things and saying words to help them form associations, and things which have been associated together increasingly feel as if they fit and belong in particular situations. As we learn language, we may or may not have images in mind when using words because of these associations. But words are not simply used to bring images into our heads or bring objects into the room. They can, but if we said words are always for calling for things, it'd be a similar mistake. We could be saying, no, that was an apple last week. I'm not calling for it now. Notice no hiccup. Notice no, oh wait, I wasn't calling for anything right now. It would be a joke. It would feel funny. We do not need to imagine an apple whenever we use the word apple. We don't. That is very very interesting. Why don't we have to have a visual image every time we use a word? That's very important to notice. And the word can be used, apple, to identify actual apples just as much as evoke imaginary ones. Why don't we have a different word for imaginary apples or two apples? Consider that children learn to use words such as this and that. This is very Wonderland. But we cannot point to what this and that are in themselves as they are used to refer to many different things. But children learn to use these words by watching others use them, associating the act of pointing to or talking about things with the words. So what this means is a child sees adults say this and that and point sometimes but not always, and the child learns in the situation, from the whole situation, that this and that are pointing words in the situation. You could not define entirely in words what this and that are because you would have to soak it up from the complex situation of learning what this and that point to because there's no way of explaining entirely in words to wolf girl raised without senses in the closet what this and that are, but children simply learn to use the words without us entirely pushing them intentionally into it because they are soaking up the practices of imitating adults who themselves did not learn the words in paragraphs which again can give you a very interesting sense of vertigo. Where are any of these words defined or totally nailed down? Think about how Shakespearean English sounds very different and almost unreadable for 1700s English to today. We actually have to transliterate Shakespeare into more still unreadable English for modern readers to still have it sound Shakespearean today. Which again, because English is not entirely nailed down, but plenty, you see, and is always adrift. 
In fact, what Wittgenstein and Derrida's work suggests is the very fact that I'm saying these words to you again means I'm re-nailing the words to their positions, and that's all it consists of. I'm remaking English right now because people talking English to you, reattaching the words again and again similarly to how you heard it in the past, is the glue that continues to hold English together. So if I and other people stop speaking English, which I'm doing right now, English falls apart. I'm re-weaving English, and everyone is who hears or talks it right now. And it consists of nothing other than my reweaving it and your reweaving it in all these situations. It's incredibly interesting to think about in connection with Shakespeare and how he talked in the same language, maybe, perhaps elder, or over, what have you. So, there is a great joke about this in Alice in Wonderland, which is highly instructive, which Wittgenstein probably noticed and may or may not have been inspired by. But the train cabin of Wittgenstein is a very important, uh, is a very important thought experiment. I will do a video on that itself. But he says, just as a brake lever in a train cabin is only a brake, uh, it breaks the train in conjunction with the rest of the machine. If you took the brake lever out of the train and you put it on a microscope stand and you examined it, you would not understand how breaking a train works. You could understand a little bit in concert with other things, yes. But in the same way you take a word out of its context, it means nothing. Uh, Wittgenstein said a train station on Mars is meaningless, and I do love that. It is very much a modern tree falling in the woods of the Zen a thousand years ago in China. For, uh, well, or at least, uh, for Hakuin in, um, for at least Hakuin in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. But anyhow, the, um, I am, am I screwing this up? I hope not. We'll keep going. So in Wonderland, a duck is asked if he knows what the word it means, and he says for him it typically points to a rock or a worm. And the question is, what did the archbishop find? Well, that's funny because we actually, uh, in the quote, and it's a wonderful Wittgensteinian joke, in the Wonderland, in the chapter of the state and the dodo for me, well, for me, it's like the archbishop found it advisable too, is what we're being told by the mouse. And of course, a user who's competent in English would know that we haven't been told yet what it means, that it's a placeholding word and we're about to be told what it means. But the duck interrupts and says, now, wait a minute. First, you have to tell me what it is, as if we would have to be told what it is before be using the word it. But we're actually using the word it, and we never find out. That's the brilliance of Carol. We never find out what it meant for the archbishop here. But that doesn't matter because we can use the non-existent. It's like a variable, like a variable in math for algebra. It's like a plate like that noise in the background is a placeholding mechanism for me imagining a truck outside. It would be odd if I did not see one. It doesn't yet have a thing that it's attached to, but it soon will, and we're open to it, let's hope. But the duck isn't. Finds this odd, says, well, usually it is a rock or a worm. What did the archbishop find? Well, we're not familiar with archbishops, regardless of how inspirational they were in uh, medieval ages for the sciences or not for examining rocks and worms, rather papal bulls or what have you. So we do not need to think of complete descriptions of what we mean in words as we mean things with words. That's very useful to see. Just as we do not need to be conscious of whether or not we use four words or five to mean something with certainty. How many adjectives did I just use? Who cares? The meaning of what we say is not found in words alone, but in the entire situation of using them. And even then you couldn't describe it fully like the spider's web reconnected which we can't. Because language works in familiar living situations, we can still use names of people and objects long after they are dead and gone to refer to them. Which is odd, but because we do not need the object to refer to the object with the word we still have. The meaning of a word is overall the way it is used, just as a toolbox holds many different tools. The toolbox, Wittgenstein's toolbox, is a great metaphor I use all the time. Hammers, pliers, saw, screwdriver, rule, ruler, glue, nails, screws, and other useful things all evolved at different times, let's think, and they don't all have to perfectly fit together. If I said, prove to me that a hammer and pliers is sufficient for every task, you'd look at me like I was weird, because all we're doing is bringing enough tools to the task, and then if I need the hammer now, ah, wait, I have a hammer. I don't need to make sure I might need one. I bring enough tools to the task in the loose toolbox. Because there may be places to snap each and every tool, it might be a uh, snappy set. And yet, if you look at it like a rough ev evolution of a bunch of things like human eyes, ears, uh, words, adjectives, nothing needs to be the underlying rule making it all make perfect, useful sense. It doesn't have to be perfectly useful. It just has to be danged useful, like heck, for all kinds of tasks. And then it survives and thrives as a toolbox we, pl uh, we <laughs> then stamp out. I mean, sequentially, you know, not getting rid of them. 
So similarly, languages have many different types of words that are used in many ways, not just it calling for a rock or a worm. Similarly, a train cabin has a crank which is moved in circles, a switch that can be on or off, and a brake which is intensified with greater pressure, and they don't all have to work like switches or brake mechanisms or pulleys. This again does not strike people immediately, but if you think about how a train cabin and a toolbox can be a diverse set of tools that drifted together, don't always have to perform in the same way, and yet are sufficient for many different tasks as required, and so we're not perfectly planned out and yet are a mechanical set of tools or a train cabin in front of you, that is one of the best ways for understanding a more Wittgensteinian, quasi-logical, quasi-mystical view of more behavioristic, practical, pragmatic life, I think. And then, whatever your beliefs about all of that, I was just talking with a good friend of mine about all of this, and he did say this really does not take away religion or mysticism or anything you like, wonder in the sciences. It actually leaves it there, and with the brass tacks, we realize brass tacks is brass tacks, and then what everything always is, or even of the brass tacks in front of us, we do not know, nor can we, with the brains and minds we have. And that is quite wonderful if we can work better with it. The point here is to do more fruitful thinking, being aware of these things, and that is why I love teaching these things. I believe that awareness of these points can make us better thinkers. More aware of all those noises outside. Let's pause and appreciate the diversity of this situation. I do not know, yes, if that was in concert or not. So because words such as apple and pear are very much the same every time we see or hear them, a la Old English, not so much, we mistakenly think that words are used in one way rather than many, like a simple set of drawers. This is again anti-Augustine. In the beginning of the Augustan Augustine, Gazon tight, what have you, he talks about going to a store is not just the guy pulls out a drawer for the five apples. Oh, you want five apples? Let me go to the five apple drawer. No, because there's interweaving of five with apples such that there isn't a five apple drawer. And that's not how your mind works with a concept of five apples specifically somewhere. That would be weird. When we think and talk about speaking and thinking philosophically, abstracting language and logic from particular complex situations, which is what formal logic after Boole was doing, what Lewis Carroll was afraid of in Boole, feared and resisted decently, and then you have Russell, uh, Frege and Russell leading to Wittgenstein's early work, and then Wittgenstein reading Wonderland to Welsh girls and rejecting that earlier work. Not simply, he was rejecting his earlier work in his middle period and then later period, and in his, in his later period, he was appreciative of Lewis Carroll, we know at least, and joked about Wonderland and read it to children. So Wittgenstein thought that logical positivism, formal logic, Russell and his earlier work misunderstood the foundations of things in just this way. Think about how formal logic is thus a good computer program and good for telephone systems and computers, but does not help us much think every day in a store at all. I must say, is merely trying to model the most basic moves of thought and then cannot do that in a multivalent way like a, perhaps even like a computer pro, uh, computer with several different processors running simultaneously can be actually networking several different things at once going on all at once, rather than one to two to three and then it's an entire set. Rather than defined and in a single exclusive and rigid way, we can see people using and successfully in loose ways and do not need to prevent this from happening by fully solving logic or our definitions and paragraphs that set and in place forever. We can see language best in the situations where it lives and works, not when it is on abstract vacation. Wittgenstein says when language goes on holiday, and what he means by language goes on holiday seems to mean Philosophers, he says, philosophy is misled when language goes on holiday. Philosophers like Russell and some are trying to take emotions, we could say, or words out of context, say this is always lust for Freud, or this is always uh, the word apple in the brain. And that is on holiday, like sort of like when you're kicking at the beach and not doing your job because you're not surrounded by the tools for doing your job. On holiday, when we break context and we put the word on vacation, for the Brits on holiday, yes? We still have holidays here, I think, in this good old USOA. So with all that uh, properly arranged sequentially, it is also similarly, I have a good friend who he mentioned to me that, and I also read this other uh, parts of this in books, that it, nobody really makes the perfect computer language. And uh, with all of that, they have to keep coming out with patches for previous programs. And it, computers are actually designed not to work perfectly they're designed for you to reboot them if they screw up, and hopefully it works the second or third time around. Now, that is also very telling, and I leave all the computerese and science to others. 
Here, of course, describing, I'm very much describing how we're not a computer. And that's great for people to, to invent computers more and more to help us with all sorts of automated tasks we would not be thinking because we don't want to. Anything more rigid, we would automate and not think, which is awesome. It actually shows us how we would put our consciousness where things are possible or variable for Poe. Thus, more fruitful. Not with complete certainty. We would automate and take out of the process. Like we do with steps of math, we find superfluous. Like making a square, not into a, drawing squares, but into a two. And just cut all that out. Because we don't need it to function simply. Bickenside said, am I a pragmatist? I guess I'm a pragmatist. I don't really like it, though, given World War II just happened, and I'm a little distrustful of mechanics and science rising in the world. What with the nukes, as he seems to be saying. But, essentially, this is very brute, basic pragmatism, um, in at least one form of it, I would say. And again, computers, even the most structured of logical machines, the computer is designed not for every program to work with every language, but to get patches or reboot it and hopefully then until it works, or not. Which is not a perfect airtight set, even for the inner logics of computers, which is as firm as firmware and formal logic can be. Just as the meaning of words depends on how we use them, the ways we classify words in groups depends on how we use the classification, Wittgenstein says. We could group tools together by the type of job they do, by the combination in which we use them, by when they are available, by weight, by color, or countless other ways, depending on whatever purposes we have and situations we find ourselves in. Notice it would be bad to do it in one way rather than all, all the others, so we may do it more or less in one way or two for organization. In a game of chess, we might group pieces into ours and theirs, pieces that are more or less valuable, pieces that can move or uh, more or less spaces, or pieces that can jump over others, depending on the situation. And we might not think of those beforehand until we do, depending on what kind of a master you are or aren't. Using these classifications in various combinations, depending on the game you're in, you don't have to think about all the games possible, which moves we want to make and which moves we want to avoid, which can change in unpredictable ways in a single game. Notice I brought in computers, Wittgenstein didn't, uh, but the chess example actually serves for such a highly logical and situated mathematical game and yet there is such unknown variables. As I mentioned before, would we want to see computer uh, game would we want to see computer games or chess games played out that were already completely known and predictable? There would be no adventure or sense of surprise, and again, even if we could fully fix reality, we might not. While we could say that language is simpler than our th that a language that is simpler than ours is incomplete if it does not suit all our purposes, Wittgenstein says, we could say that the languages we use are all incomplete, as they do not yet contain all of the words and ways to use them that we need for all our possible and future purposes, and we leave things open for that. Our languages, like old cities, Wittgenstein says a city is uh, a language is like an old city. I've been to, uh, I like the joke, Salt Lake City, and it's like a grid around the Mormon temple, and if you're on like West 3rd and North something, you know exactly where you are in the city, at least in the major center of town. In San Francisco, you're driving around and suddenly there's a mountain and a dead end of a major road, and, every, and all the traffic gets screwed up. Because an old city has a lot of different overlapping parts and just everything's kind of squished together. San Francisco famously was built by two different, uh, there were two different brothers who planned out the city, and along Market Street it just doesn't fit because one brother planned out this part and another this part of downtown good job everybody and again brothers from other mothers and all the complex of all of that so with all of that languages like old cities are mazes of large and small buildings streets and spaces that grew over many years and in many stages like all that construction outside continuously in which there is never a good time for any of this and they are just as complete now as they were before the suburbs of modern chemistry and infinitesimal calculus grew around them Think about that, how there was not such a thing as modern chemistry or algebra. I would believe there wasn't a thing such as math originally. And then new whole districts overlapping with other districts of language in which people are interacting and moving all about town, grow around and into them. <laughs> Speaking of the noises with all of that. So given all of that, actually, 
Um, I have much more to say here, and I'm going to break this into a 50-minute chunk so I can break this off with another talk. And again, that annoying noise is outside or just interweaving with my thinking too much. So let's call this an old city, or at least North North Oakland in the old. And let's say that they're still building a lot of housing out here, and I wonder how much it's affordable or not. But much love, much happiness, and I will continue break this talk here off in half because I've still got plenty to do and we're already 50 minutes in. Much love, much life, much highly unknown variables to you and yours, including children, if you want them. And I will see you, as usual, or hear you, if I ever see or hear you.